Hello and welcome to the Game Theory Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Vicini. We are presented by The Athletic. And I'm guessing that this intro is the most energy that you get from me the entire show. I'm trying to give a quick little burst to get everyone excited because this is a great, great day. This is a great set of days. We're in the middle of the best four days on the basketball schedule, in my opinion. It's the NCAA tournament, and the first round has just ended with Indiana beating Kent State. I think that game just went final, right, Mark? Yeah. Yes. So we're going to dive into everything that happened this weekend. I am exceptionally tired. I have woken up at 3.45 in the morning each of the last two days. It's now 3.45 p.m. here. Mark is, I think it's 12.45 uh, a.m. where Mark is. Yeah. So he's been absolutely incredible uh, coming to join this show. We're going to try and do this. We're going to try and run through the games that we saw. We're going to try and run through everything that happened over the weekend. But first, Mark, how's it going, man? Dude, I, same boat. It was, uh, we'll talk more <laughs> about it off pod, but it's been the most draining weekend of my 2023. And it, it's been Saturday for 57 minutes. So we, we're here, man. But yeah, basketball is, uh, it is awesome. Uh, what, a, what a start to March Madness, man. Yeah, it was unbelievable. It's great. This time of year, I feel like I have no idea what day it is. I told you before we went live that uh, for the first day, literally we were done with one day and it was my wife and I's first date anniversary. Like nine years ago, we went on our first date together. Uh, and yesterday in the car driving back from dinner, I literally had to ask her, wait, what day is it? Because over here, you just lose track of days in general when you're trying to live on United States time. Oh, you imagine. don't know what's going on half the time as it is. And we literally had to stop and like think about it. And it was a little bit concerning for me for a second there. But that's okay. And it's all good. Most importantly is everything that happened over the course of the last 48 hours. That includes Purdue becoming the second one seed in NCAA tournament history to lose to a 16 seed. And I would argue this is the biggest upset in first round history of the NCAA tournament. Why is that? Fairly Dickinson, for people who do not know, did not win their conference tournament. Merrimack won the NEC conference tournament and Merrimack is not eligible to play in the NCAA tournament due to archaic rules regarding a four-year transition period where teams cannot make the NCAA tournament for the first four years that they are in Division I. That left the door open for Fairleigh Dickinson, who we will now refer to as FDU moving forward, to make the tournament at 18 and 15. They go, they blow the doors off of Texas Southern. Tobin Anderson, the coach of Fairleigh Dickinson, in the locker room, after the game, tells his team, you know what? Cam told me at breakfast today, Cam Morrell, their assistant coach, the more I watch Purdue, the more I think we can beat them. And they went in and they beat Purdue 63 to 58. An unbelievable performance, an unbelievable performance by FDU. I cannot believe that we got to see a one versus 16 upset this year. What were your overriding thoughts watching that game? Oh man. Uh, it, well, <laughs> the w worst, worst game possible for your starting backcourt to have their worst games of the season. Like that was, yeah. uh, I think what's so tough in this is, I mean, part of it too. I, I think I sometimes get caught too much up in the long view. Um, so for tournament time, I feel like I'm always thinking more like bigger picture. Um, it's just tough. Like Braden Smith has been incredible this year for Purdue. And I, I mean, he's had maybe the worst performance out of anybody in the tournament so far, like being completely yeah. blunt. Like that was really rough. Um, Foster lawyer really struggled to get going. Uh, just anything traction wise. I do just want to say too, and it's not just me trying to hedge my bets, but like, Anybody pointing out that this was on Zach Eady just needs to re rethink what they're looking at, man. Because <laughs> I think that they they lost that game in spite of everything Zach Eady did. I thought he was pretty solid defensively, offensively. I mean, he was 
everywhere on the glass. They just could not get the ball in whatsoever. Like he was getting triple teamed. Um, yeah. It it felt like there was there was not a single four that Purdue had that could get guarded. Um, yeah. I was honestly almost surprised that they didn't try and just go with four smalls out on the court because like Mason Gillis and Caleb first were just getting completely laid off of. Um, that was a. I mean, ex- exactly like was mentioned. I mean, I think that was as perfect a game plan execution as as we've seen in the tournament, other than what Princeton did to Arizona. But that was like, yeah, man, that was really about as rough a game as could happen for Purdue. Yeah, Zach Eady ends up going for 21-15 and 15 in this game. 7-11 from the field, 7-10 of 10 from the free throw line. And look, I'm doing a big thing on this breakdown and uh, on this upset for the athletic I think for tomorrow, as long as I get it done here. And what I keep coming back to is not Zach Eady. I think Zach Eady was actually pretty okay defensively in this game. Like if you go and you watch, we're going to talk about the uh, Arizona game in a little bit. I thought Ajolas Tabellas was like completely out of his depth in that game. Yeah. Zach Eady was not like Zach Eady handled switches. He handled ISOs pretty well in this game. Like I'm going to, actually break down tape and like show you uh, in this thing I'm writing for the athletic tomorrow, but he was pretty okay. Like early on FDU's strategy was actually to put him as the ball handler defender in ball screen actions. And he just like got through screens and it was fine. And he stayed in front of his man and contested. It was really impressive. It was genuinely, I think that Zach Eady had some moments that were, disappointing like any big will have when you're run through the gamut of ball screen opportunities, you know, possession after possession, after possession, you're not going to go, you know, hundred percent in those things, but it wasn't his fault. The guards had no recovery ability. The guards for FDU blew by them with real speed for people who don't know Grant Singleton, Dimitri Roberts. These are two very small, very fast players that are capable of really getting separation in those ball screen scenarios. And FDU plays five out basketball. And typically this is the kind of team that would give Purdue problems, would give Zach Eady problems, but it was mostly fine. I mean, you can point to the fact that the guy that Zach Eady spent most of the night guarding Sean Moore, he ended up with 19. He led the team in scoring, but like Sean Moore went three of 10 from three. He went, you know, 19 points on 18 shooting attempts with a turnover and no assists. If you're Purdue and the guy that Zach Eady is guarding one-on-one when FDU is repeatedly and time after time attacking him to try and get that advantage because they think they have that advantage defensively. If I told you that that guy went for essentially one point per possession, Purdue would take that, I think. Like undeniably, let alone like forget like passes out that Edie stifles, right? I think Purdue takes one point per possession, assuming that Purdue can outscore one point per possession on the other end because they've only had, I think, three or four games this year where they haven't scored more than one point per possession. And oh, by the way, FDU, who we'll talk about defensively in a second, they are like one of the 10 worst defenses statistically in all of college basketball. The strategy for Purdue and for Zach Eady was fine. This one is not on Zach Eady. I just want to be crystal clear with everybody. Zach Eady was fine in that game. The drop coverage scheme was not bad in that game. It was the guards just getting their ass kicked. That was the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, exactly. And also worth noting too, I think it was said on broadcast, like statistically the smallest starting lineup in the country was yep. fairly Dickinson. I think they said average player was six, three and it felt it too. Like they really pushed the pace. Um, but I think what was most egregious was the, the rebounding. Like they killed Purdue on the glass, especially late. Like they were flying everywhere for everything. Purdue didn't box out at all. Um, it was it, like, truly it was just, it was like stunning to watch. Um, like, it, I mean, not, not the exact same as the St. Peter's game last year against, against Purdue, but it, I mean, a lot of shades of the same stuff. So a little bit. So some, someone mentioned that, um, in one of the group texts that I'm in 
and, and I disagree with it a little bit. Mm-hmm. St. Peter's, what they did particularly was they attacked Oscar Shibwe in ball screens repeatedly and Oscar failed in pick and roll. Oh, coverage. no, no. I meant with when St. Peter's played Purdue last year. Oh, when St. Peter's played Purdue. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. That's a really good point. Yeah, sorry. Again, it's very tired. It's very, no, dude, you know, trust we've been me up that. forever <laughs> at this point. Mark's been up for 16 hours. I've been up for 12 hours watching basketball and working consecutively. We're both delirious at this point. Yeah. But they really crowded Edie on the block. I felt like they did a great job of forcing him into difficult situations. He ended up with two turnovers, but it felt like more, didn't it? Like it felt like he turned the ball over, you know, five or six times where they might have gotten somebody else for a turnover. Mm-hmm. or, you know, maybe, you know, didn't have control of the ball completely. So they charged the turnover to somebody else uh, because they were crowding him as much as they were. Yeah. And look, credit to where it's due with FDU. Tobin Anderson in this coaching staff did a phenomenal job of figuring out how to guard Purdue. They crowded the interior and then they rotated on a string to stop three-pointers or at least contest three-pointers. Undeniably, when you are a 16 going up against a one, you need some luck. You do, right? Like, you absolutely need to get some luck. I think they got some luck. Purdue missed a lot of open threes, right? Yeah, Yeah, Purdue missed a lot of open threes. This is amazing. (laughs) No, I thought Uh, thought you froze for a second. (laughs) God damn it. So Purdue missed a lot of open threes that happens in games like this. And you have to be able to, on some level, you know, work through that really. And it felt like, did it feel like to you that Purdue kind of got tight? That's what it felt like to me in the second half. They kind of got tight, right? Yeah. No, I think without question, it felt like they were tight. Um, Like even with Zach, like I I, actually, I never really felt like Zach got tight, but I think it was more so again, the guards and fours were just, um, like Foster, not Foster, geez. Fletcher Lawyer has been like dynamite the entire year for them and what he's done. And I, this is like yeah. the most congested he felt tonight and everything he was doing. Like even that three late, I know uh, like the broadcast was hammering saying like, oh, you don't need the quick three. You don't need the quick three. But also like he kind of, he kind of forced himself into it with where he was at. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I've seen him be comfortable taking pretty well contested stuff. Um it just was like there was a lot of vexing process that went on from players that was like – I didn't even think it was necessarily anything that the defense did. It was just like moment got to him. I mean, look, these are teenagers, right? Like yeah, Fletcher exactly. Lawyer, I, like, I, I mean Smith that. They're so saying. young. Like, you cannot right. blame these dudes like, for it. Like it, it happens. Basketball. Yeah, I mean, look, like they're accountable for the fact that this happened, right? Like you absolutely – it's on them on some level in the way that – losses somebody is accountable for losing games but all it's understandable at the same level yeah. right it's it makes sense that these guys struggled in these games and i agree with you i don't think there was a single second where zach Eady shrunk from the moment like it felt like to me last year like kentucky i was talking to like a friend of mine over text as this was happening it felt like to me last year like kentucky shrunk from the moment a little bit like almost all of their guys right it didn't feel that way to me this year with Edie. Like it felt like Edie wanted the ball and they couldn't get it to him. Like he took one shot in the last 12 minutes. That's crazy. Yeah. Like that, that for Purdue's guards to not be able to get him the ball again, credit where it's due to after you, their guards, their pressure at the point of attack was incredible and they deserve a lot of credit here. But like, it's also kind of on Purdue's guards on some level and that's a bummer, but like, you're a one seed going up against a 16 seed that didn't win their conference tournament. Like you should be dictating this game, you know? Yeah. No, 100%. Um, They, they did dictate the door after the game though. So. (laughs) Uh, Do you have anything else to say about this? Look, like I, I do have some questions about like, you know, Matt Painter in NCAA tournament games. I think those are reasonable. Yeah, I mean, with, I mean, we, we're, we've had the same conversation how many times over the last yeah. however long? And I do want to say, too, like, I mean, obviously the regular season production can't be undersold. I do think it's easy to, to undersell that stuff. But at the same point, like, Purdue is here to be 
extremely competitive in the postseason. So it has been disappointing. Yeah. Um, but I think my main takeaway is just like, man, congrats to Fairleigh Dickinson. Like that, that, yep. that shit's awesome to watch. Like um, I, I was talking to a friend about this earlier today, but like part of the, like yesterday, I think my favorite game to watch was Penn State, Texas A&M, just from the virtue of like <laughs> Texas, like Penn State completely executed their game plan perfectly. They played yeah. a perfect game. And I yeah. felt the same way watching Fairleigh Dickinson. Like, that's the kind of stuff that I enjoy watching. Like, obviously, you want a close game. You want a really good game. And I think you, you obviously got that today. But I think, again, it's when you see a team that that plays, like, perfectly to their strengths, executes game plan, it's just so fun to watch, man. It really is. Okay, let's take a quick commercial break. Then we're going to jump in to a couple more upsets that occurred uh, yesterday and today as well. All right, Mark, let's go. Let's talk about Arizona versus Princeton. You brought up that you thought Princeton's game plan yesterday was absolutely terrific, and I agree with you. What did you like so much about the way that they went about attacking Arizona uh, en route to a 15-2 upset victory? Yeah, it was kind of wild because it didn't even feel like it really played out until the second half um, because, obviously, I mean, so much of what has made Arizona successful this year uh, is their big to big ability like so few teams have actually had the personnel to match up with with two guys who are 6'10, 6'11 that can both uh, be as effective as they are on the glass and and in the post and, and Azulus Tabellas and, and Omar Balo. And um, Princeton basically just said, okay, <laughs> well, we're only going to guard the guy who's on the post, basically. I mean, like it, it was yep. such a I love watching Azulus Tabellas play basketball, he's dynamite when he's on. But I think you saw all of the uh, all of the difficulties that he has as like a very real prospect play out yesterday, and it's so much less to me about the shot and more about the hesitancy um, and uh, and record scratching that happens when he gets the ball in a place he's not comfortable. Like he is not comfortable taking longer floaters or push shots. He's he's not comfortable taking jumpers from sixteen feet. He's not comfortable taking the jumpers from deep and. Princeton just said, okay, we're going to make you make decisions. And it killed Arizona's half court because yeah. every single pass into Ballo became a, uh, a bobble ball or a, a difficult catch point um, or just a turnover because of, they, they really struggle with getting the passes going on inbounds. Um, and also too, like they just, I mean, their guards didn't really have it off the dribble either. Like Courtney Ramey really struggled yesterday, which I think that was, that was tough to see because He's been, I mean, somebody who was awesome in the tournament last year, has been a really steady college guard his entire career. Yep. Um, and they needed him yesterday. And again, like, I think you saw some of the flaws in what Arizona's guard depth was this year. Um, yeah. Like, Kylan Boswell has been, it really turned it up over the last month or so of the season, but again, was not fully there yesterday. Um, well, and he, he should be like a high school senior right now. Well, yeah, he's exactly. One of like, the he's youngest like, freshman he's like in the 17. country. So, I, I, yeah. exa- I mean, exactly. Like, you can't expect too much of him, but that's part of the problem. When, when your best guard, struggled as much as, as Ramey did like I think you saw some of those issues but again it comes down to Princeton just saying okay well we're comfortable saying that you only have three maybe two and a half guys that can space the floor we're going to do whatever we can to sell out deny anything to this to, to the post and it killed anything Arizona can get going because the, the issue too is like all right if you go well we'll just put Tabellus on the block and, and move Bowell no like Bowell has even more of the same issue so it's it's like you're playing essentially two centers together. And when a team decides, hey, we're going to defend you like you're playing two centers, it, there's not really a lot you can do about it. So um, that was – I mean, that was just pretty awesome stuff to see from Princeton and how they sold out to do it. Yeah, I thought it was tremendous. I thought that from you know Arizona's perspective, this is just a roster that's always been flawed. And it was particularly more flawed – yesterday because Kerr Creesa is dealing with a shoulder injury, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And Kerr started the season absolutely phenomenally. He looked like he was the best guard on Arizona. And then he tailed off a little bit later in the season and then got hurt in the Pac-12 tournament. And I think that that really kind of took away any of his on-ball shooting ability, right? He didn't look real comfortable shooting yesterday, I didn't think. When you take that away... And then you take away the interior, as you explained, because that was the entire goal. 
And then more than anything with Arizona, what Princeton took away, I thought, was the transition attack. Because that is where Arizona is deadly, is when those guards get downhill and you know it starts to become an up-and-down game and those bigs trail and then it's hard to stop them because they're downhill and they're so big and strong and they can run the court. It's really, really tough, I think. It's really, really tough to stop them. But Princeton sold out to stop in transition. They had like 22 plus seconds per possession, I would imagine. And they made sure that every shot was a good one and they didn't turn it over. This is a Princeton team that only had 11 turnovers yesterday. And while they only scored 88 points per 100 possessions, they sold, they hold Arizona to 82 points per 100 possessions in this game. 0.82 points per possession which I would imagine is the lowest of the Tommy Lloyd era. And in large part, it's because of the way that they sold out to stop transition. More than that, though, with Arizona, I I just think that this was a very flawed roster because you you can either win two ways, in my opinion, in the NCAA tournament. You can just be absolutely incredible at anything that gets presented to you, right? Like you you, you can just be so good at what you do that you overwhelm opposing teams, right? And oftentimes to do that, you have to have overwhelming talent to be able to do that. You have to have legitimate multiple NBA pro prospects. I think Gonzaga has a non-zero chance to do that. Like, look, they have pro prospects, like Timmy on some level is a pro prospect. Julian Strother uh, is certainly a pro prospect. But they have been like 10 points per 100 possessions better than anybody offensively over the course of like the last 12 games of their season and since like February 1st. Arizona's not really that. Like Arizona's been fine this year at what they do. They haven't been above and beyond everybody else in terms of offensive execution. The second way that you can win is you can just scheme and match up and have a lot of different versatility to be able to cause problems for whatever opposing teams present to you. Right. Like I'm trying to think of an example, like, you know, what example actually strikes me. Do you remember the Michigan state team that had like Denzel Valentine and like Gavin Schilling and those guys. And they made that like surprise final four run. Oh, don't never forget Brandon Dawson. uh, Yes. six, Six rebounding machine. I kind of thought about this because I know that you know that well. Uh, We won't talk about what happened against Duke. (laughs) That did not happen. (laughs) Did not happen. Yeah. But that team had a lot of different ways that they could scheme you, right? They could go small with like even Brandon Dawson at the five occasionally, or they could go big and like try and out physical you, out muscle you. They could go skill ball. They could go power ball. Like there was just a lot of different things that they could do. And they had super, super smart players all across the court. Denzel Valentine being the key one, Mm. but Arizona doesn't really have that because they don't have like a stretch spacing four. like their closest is either Pele Larson or Cedric Henderson. Right. Yeah. That was the other thing I want to say too. I thought one of the things that was absolutely killer for Arizona too, was the way that they they went under on every single Larson screen, like again, just to shrink the floor. And that's been, again, part of the issue this year. Like, I felt he's always been somebody who needs to get six or seven three-point attempts up per 100. And he's yep. he's just been pretty hesitant to do that. Like, the drive game's cool, but it just wasn't there for him at all with how they attacked it. And he, I don't even think he attempted a three today, if I remember correctly, yeah. or yesterday. Um, so, it, yeah, it's just a tough, tough to deal with. And, and, like, the guy that it could be for them long-term, let's say at the very least, is Adama Ball. Right. Like I'm kind of interested in him long term, six foot seven, very skilled wing. You could see a circumstance where he could slide down to the four and be that skilled four man. But they just didn't have that this year. They just didn't have one of those guys that like you could truly trust at it. And even so, whenever you did, you were still only really playing four out because neither of those two guys, Umar Balo or Ajolas Tabellas, can shoot. Tabellas obviously has a lot of gravity with like dribble handoff games and his passing ability, but. it's just not, it's hard to win in the tournament with two bigs like this. And I think, you know, while we just talked about the fact that, you know, Zach Eady, it wasn't his fault defensively. And it's, it's hard to win. I think in college basketball 
when you build around bigs coming into the year, this was billed as like the year of the returning big man. Mm. Right. And you look across college basketball, who were the most disappointing teams this year? North Carolina with Armando Baycott, Hunter Dickinson at Michigan. Hunter had a great year. Team was bad. You know, we're looking at Kentucky right now with Oscar Shibway. I don't know if you can call them one of the most disappointing teams, but they're a six seed right now, and they probably shouldn't be a six seed. It's hard for them to defend with Oscar. This is one of the worst defensive Kentucky teams we've seen in a while. Arizona goes out in the first round. Purdue goes out in the first round. Um, you know, who, who else? Like Florida was one of the most disappointing teams around Colin Castleton, right? It's hard to win. I think in modern basketball in general, but now this is trickling down to the college side as well, where it already has been so prevalent in the NBA. It is very hard to win when your game plan is centered around a big, in my opinion. I think I'd almost add like, cause I agree to an extent, but I think it extends more to when you don't have the ability to, to have versatility. Cause like even with Purdue, like they yes. don't have the ability to, really do anything different it's like okay yes. well we're going to be really good at this one thing and the second you get taken away from it's like oh well we're kind of fucked um and i think yeah. that like when you're looking at all those teams because like you look at kentucky like nobody's really developed into a pop threat there i think that there were hopes that damian collins would um yeah. that hasn't happened um top has not been consistent with that like to be fair to like top had a very good game today but point being like i just think like exactly like you're hitting on like just kind of like morphing with what you're talking about with the Michigan State team. Like, if you don't have the ability to be multiple and have answers for when teams are going to throw different different things at you, especially too, like, I'd almost argue it's harder in college in some ways because you're going yeah. – I mean, by, like, you play so many more different teams. Like, there's that many more different rosters. Like, there's so much more variety. Um, it makes it well, so and- difficult. On top of it, the court is even more condensed in college basketball as well, which makes it even easier to contest these guys and make it more difficult for them in terms of their life. You know, one team that maybe breaks this mold is Connecticut with Adama Sonogo and Donovan Klingon. Like they do go through the post and they are one of the best offensive rebounding teams. They're actually the best offensive rebounding team in the country. But like you're saying, Mark, it's not actually the – centerpiece of their offense the centerpiece of their offense to me at least is more them running jordan hawkins off of a shit ton of screens and trying to create threes first and then using sonogo as the bailout as opposed to sonogo and playing through him first in sonogo you look like he's even developed a three-point shot this year beyond what anybody could have expected yeah and then when you look at it what it does defensively too like they play much more close to the level of the screen with sonogo they'll play more of a yep. deeper drop with clinging like it, it just gives them more answers and ability and um it makes it tougher for teams because like again like you, they have it i mean with how much talent connecticut has to like that it makes it harder but like exactly like you mentioned i think it they have multiple things that play into one another they can they can piece things together to to play differently and it, it works. It's hard to, it's hard for other teams to match up with that. It's easier for you to kind of be more successful in those ways. Yeah. And you know, another team that is in the second round is Creighton, right? Creighton doesn't play through Ryan Kalkbrenner. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like Ryan Kalkbrenner in the post is option five for them. Right. Uh, there are great bigs around college basketball that are still in this tournament, but there aren't as many as you would think. Like, Honestly, the most post-centric team remaining in this tournament is probably Penn State, right? Just sure. their weirdo, like, booty ball, Jalen Pickett, post-ups. But the thing is that they shoot threes better than anybody else in the country, which allows them to execute their game plan to a T and invert the offense and make it harder for the defense to guard them. I just don't think that these bigs – you know, centerpieces offensively, I just strongly believe it is not the way to go. It is a route to regular season wins. It is not a route to tournament success, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And another team that got stretched out and got knocked out was Virginia. Furman beats them on one of the most baffling moments I've seen in college basketball in a while with Kia Clark. Uh, instead of using a timeout. And I say it's baffling. 
is a credit to Kie as much as anything, because this has been one of the smartest, like most cerebral players in college basketball for multiple years now. And for him to just forget they had a timeout is crazy to me. And he throws the ball 40 feet down the court, uh, gets picked off. Garrett Heen passes it to JP Pegues. Pegues makes the three and Virginia is out and Furman continues to dance. But what the big key for Furman was, was Jalen Slauson, right? Yeah, no, he was so good in that game. Uh, he got like, I don't want to say shut down. Like he struggled a little bit um, at points, but he really came through for them when, when they needed him. And obviously like what happened at the end was, I mean, I, I that was, uh, it was, it was weird because the last minute, like obviously Virginia was up, I think five with, uh, with like 30 seconds left. Um, you, I still just had this overwhelming feeling of like something's gonna happen here. Just like the way that the game had been going. Yeah, with, I did too. With like, and I, because I, I didn't even with the Purdue game, I kept feeling like, oh, they're gonna pull it together. They're gonna pull it together. I watched Purdue the entire year. Like they're gonna be fine. It is part of just like having the uh, the frame of reference already with Virginia, probably uh, with Kihei on the team as well. Probably like adds the actual like the, the extra layer of uh, seasoning to it and, and, and feeling it might happen, but. Um, it was weird. Like I, it never, it, at the expense of sounding like cliche based, it never really felt like Furman was rattled in that game. Like I, it, it always felt like they were yeah. on top of their shit and what they wanted to do. Um, but yeah, no, Slauson was so fun. I think he's somebody I really want to go back and rewatch how he looked in that game. Um, cause I feel like I was just so locked into enjoying the game. What was happening since the first game of March madness, you know, but, um, yeah, that was, are we going to hit that high again? Like, are we going to feel that same high again at any point during the tournament? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I mean, look, we got some great finishes in the night session. Tonight. I hit the me screaming running around in my basement uh, yeah. during that at like 12, whenever that was, like 1, 1 30 p.m. Eastern. Like, that was, that was wild. That that was at 5 30 5 45 a.m my time oh, here Christ. so i was just sitting there in my office watching these games while laura my wife is trying to sleep i'm just like just like totally quiet like fist pumping and going nuts it ruled it was amazing and i don't think we're going to get a moment like that again because it's hard to find moments like that that is genuinely one of the craziest things i've seen happen on a basketball court kind of right <laughs> For Virginia, uh, I mean, it, it's it's hard. Like, I think that they just didn't have the dudes this year as much as anything. Like, people want to make this a referendum on Tony Bennett and on the Virginia scheme. This team has, like, no pros right now. Like, Ryan Dunn might be a pro. Like, maybe. Uh, it's very possible at some point he could be one. But he's nowhere near that level right now. Uh, they just don't have dudes. And when you don't have dudes, you know, all due respect to Reese Beekman, who might be an NBA player purely based on defensive ability, it's just going to be hard for you. It's just going to be really, really hard for you when you get to tournament time. I do think it's interesting too, because uh, some I don't remember who brought this up to me, but there's a good point in just like pace of play in general. I think it's really hard to be a team that, or you're just open, I should say, you are opening yourself up to some fuckery if you are a team that likes to play really low pace, low possessions, yeah. Um, yeah. because you're not going to blow teams out. Like Virginia has not been a team that blows people out this year. Like obviously like you are opening, <laughs> you are opening yourself up to some fuckery. That it's is true, a man. It's a I mean, great like, it's point. That's a so great way true. to put it. Cause like all it takes is if you like, it's uh did you ever play like the NCAA March Madness games? Yes. Yeah. It's like when you have, okay. When they first implemented the pace, and tempo system in it um so like you're a really slow half court team and then the other team gets three turnovers in a row and the bar goes green for them and that's exactly how it felt like <laughs> in watching that game like that's how it feels in watching virginia when they get rattled by a team because it's like okay well we don't play like that we can't play like that that's not our style and it just uh it, it really bites you like yeah that was uh yeah it, and especially because Furman's been so good at playing out in transition this year too but um yeah, that was it was it was a well, drawing watch. And Furman plays five out like they are yeah. a really, really smart, really, really difficult team. And like, by the way, 
what I was worried about was like if Caden Shedrick and those guys could like stay on the court. And they did. Like Caden, Caden was, was awesome there. He was that's like, that's again what was so th- like he he's a guy who uh, I I still don't think that he's quite there from an offensive standpoint. But the uh, the defense for him is so fun to watch, man. Like he was 100%. awesome yesterday on the glass and and defensively and and just yeah, it happens. Yeah, and they they stretched out Virginia. They made it way harder for them across the board to do anything really effectively. I think they deserve so much credit. I think they deserve so, so much credit for uh, the scheme that they went down the road of. They went small when they had to go small. They went bigger when they had to go bigger with Heen as a stretch five. I thought it was super, super smart uh, what Bob Ritchie did. And Bob Ritchie is, you know, analytics, a lot of threes, space the court, you know, everything that you want, everything that you want from a coach in the modern game. And I would expect that, you know, a lot of teams are going to try and get Bob Ritchie because I think that was a really, really sharp way to go about things. Uh, in terms of other teams that lost, I don't know that we've really got to go through any more true upsets, right? I think that that was really it. We only had, by the way, seven lower seeds lose, including uh, – or seven lower seeds win, I'm sorry – including two nines and a 10 like that. There was, this was a year that did not have as many upsets. It's just that we got the, the upsets were loud. Like, were yeah. wild. Yeah. 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 So maybe let's, let's transition to this instead of talking about what these teams did wrong anymore. Let's talk about what some teams did, right? Who was the team that impressed you most this weekend? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I already mentioned Penn state. Because I did think they were really fun. I felt uh, I felt they were underseeded coming into the tournament, um, especially yeah. like looking at how every team. Because especially, like, I mean, that was such a tough draw for Texas A and M. Because like Texas A and M too had been playing really well to close out the year. Um, they were always going to have the struggles just based on what their offense is, especially if Wade Taylor doesn't get going like in the Penn State game. But like this Penn State team, uh, with how good their offense is, with how disciplined they've been defensively. Um, over the last month or so and what they looked like in the Big Ten tournament, uh, like that is a tough draw for anybody in that bracket. Um, they're in the West bracket, right? I'm trying to remember. Um, cause I'm, they're I'm in yeah, I was, the weird one yeah. where it, I think they play, um, they play Texas next. I think they're in the Midwest. I, that is a tough matchup for Texas. Like I, I agree because I, and I, I this is not meant as slander towards Texas, they're probably the two seed I feel like least strong about in terms of their ability to move forward. Um, and with what Texas and shooting woes have been at times this year, that's a, I mean, I'm interested to see what that looks like for Penn state, but mainly it was like Jalen, Jalen Pickett had the game of his life yesterday. He was so good. Uh, shout out to Michael Bisping's uh, doppelganger, uh, Andrew Funk, who was flying off flare screens yesterday, <laughs> hitting everything. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Seth Lundy didn't even have that good of a game. And like they were still yeah. just blowing out Texas and them. Like that was that was fantastic. Like I, I'm very excited to see what this team can do in the tournament. So I think they make the second weekend. I think they have a good shot. The team that I think is about to go on a deep run, especially now with the way the bracket has opened up, is Duke. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Duke, I think, looked absolutely phenomenal against a very good Oral Roberts offensive team. Duke over the course of the last really six weeks, I would say has been one of the best defensive teams in the country. Everything that we expected from Derek Lively coming into this season, where he was supposed to be the defensive anchor was supposed to be the guy that really uh, led and created a exceptionally high level defensive team. It's all there. He is hitting on every single cylinder imaginable right now as a defensive player. You want to play him in drop? He is probably, I don't know, is he the best drop coverage defender right now in college basketball? He probably is, right? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, it was, it was kind of crazy because, um, they, I mean, they, what was really fun to see is how close they played him to the level of the screen yesterday. Cause I mean, off rip, yep. Oral Roberts was like, all right, we're going to drag you out, see what we can do. I actually thought they waited way too long to try and drag the screens out farther. Cause I think that would have yep. been interesting to see. But um, like Ace Miss, if 
seeing 15 shots feels like uh, way more than he actually took yesterday because so many of his uh, like his shooting pocket just got erased yesterday yep. with how mu- with how much they crowded stuff with how hard they made it for him to actually get any kind of space. Um, and a lot of that was, I mean, like it, it, the credits obviously to, to lively uh, Filipowski, I thought was really good defensively. Obviously had four steals. He was really good in the passing lanes and just being aggressive with his hands um, being big too. But like Brian Geisinger, a friend of mine pointed this out yesterday too. Um, Mark Mitchell's defense has really started to pop the last couple of weeks. Like not, yeah, this is not me trying to say he's a prospect or anything right now, but in terms of filling in as a guy who, who really can roam back line, who can just be big and in the right places. Like you look at this team up and down, just what, with what their starting lineup is. All right. Roach, Mitchell, Lively, Proctor, Filipowski. You have one guy shorter than six, five in that group. Like there's a ton of length, a ton of size, uh, and looking at what they're – I mean, but I'm excited for their matchup with Tennessee. This is about to be an ugly-ass basketball game. But in terms of looking at a team that can maybe try and, like, muck things up and play physical with them, just from a different standpoint of, like, okay, well, Oral Roberts is pretty small. They're trying to spread the floor more. Tennessee is just going to be attacking the offensive glass, trying to body you, uh, trying to be as physical as possible. Um, seeing what that looks like on a different stage. I'm very interested to see what that is. Um, I would pick Duke over them for sure. Just because, especially, you know, just given Tennessee's injuries. Um, But yeah, this, this Duke team is really starting to click right now. And I didn't even mention the Whitehead popped yesterday and it wasn't just like, yes, part of it, you can just be like hot shooting, but it was the confidence. The confidence was so nice to see. Like he looked comfortable. It was the most comfortable he's looked on court the entire season from, from what I've seen with him. Um, and that was big in getting anything out of him. If you're getting extra stuff out of him, getting more of what I think expectations were prior to the year, um, that's monumental for what they do. Because right now, I mean, their bench has been pretty quiet. Like Ryan Young does some stuff for them. Jacob Branson has also quietly been a little bit like, I don't want to say disappointing, but I was expecting a little bit better from him this year. Um, yep. So getting anything out of Dariq that is a plus is, is huge for them in the tournament. So, Totally agree with you on that. I, I think that it's enormous that Dariq Whitehead uh, might be a thing now, offensively. I'm not going to let, let us off the hook without talking more about Derek Lively. Yeah, uh, definitely. Derek Lively's ability, uh, what I was getting at was like, I think he's the best drop defender in college basketball right now. You mentioned him playing at the level of the screen. I thought he was terrific playing at the level of the screen yesterday and being able to get the ball out of Basemith's hands. I think that's what they did most. They just completely made it so that Max did not beat them, right? Like that was the goal. They were just like, we will let Connor Vanover beat us. We'll let Isaac McBride beat us. We're not letting this guy beat us. And Lively was phenomenal. I think Kyle Filipowski is a way underrated defender uh, as well. He is very, very good at being able to play at the level and recovering. He plays a little upright, but he's actually pretty mobile, I think, yeah. and is going to be an impactful NBA defender uh, on some level, just insofar as he's not going to get attacked, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that I believe in him more defensively even than someone like Grady Dick on the ball, if I'm com- being completely honest. How do you feel about that? Uh, I'd have to like compare them side by side, but I think like I'm I'm with you. Like even just, like off rip, I think I felt good about his defense the entire year. Like I think yeah, I uh, agree. He's been like obviously like there are some of the offensive things that um, we'll have to talk about for sure at some point. But like the yeah. uh, what he's done off uh, as a defender this year has really impressed me all year. Like I I yeah. think the, I mean the the because I was very interested. Like I'm always interested in like a multifaceted forward or front court player. So seeing him pop the way that he has and less pop, but more just like, I'm not a target. Uh, I felt that the entire year with him. And I think yep. again, like you see that um, with, with how lively started to play as well. Yeah. And with lively monster is a weak side rim protector monster in terms of being able to get contested rebounds. The entire package was on display. I thought the first seven minutes of that game where they held oral Sounded. Roberts scoreless I thought that that was the best I've seen a single defender play in college basketball this season. Point yeah. Uh, yeah. Derek Lively was incredible in that game. Okay. I literally just want a couple of words on every game. This is gotcha. going to be it. There might be a game or two that we stop on and like actually do stuff with, but 
at least to start, let's just say like a couple of words about every game that occurred here. Let's start with Alabama, Texas A&M, Corpus Christi. Brandon Miller, zero points in this game. Alabama's entire NCAA tournament hopes rest on how healthy Brandon Miller's groin is, right? Yeah, definitely. It's just um, kind of it. Yeah. Not anything else to take away from that. I don't have any. Uh, I Yeah, yeah no, no I, I I don't have anything else to take away from that one. Maryland, say, West I'm Virginia. I'm not worried about the zero points. Like, it, we'll see in the second round, but yeah, no, I'm not worried about it. I'm not either. Uh, West Virginia, Maryland. Maryland wins 67-65. Sneaky fun game to start the day Shout yesterday. Out Julian Reese. Shout out Julian Reese. He was very, very good in this game. Kedron Johnson was terrific in this game at 27 points, and it seemed like he was just like never going to miss a shot. But Julian Reese was really big. He had, I think, like 17 and 8 and a few assists and was just very, very polished and confident the entire game. Yeah, no, 100%. Obviously, uh, not on the same level as a sister angel at LSU, but it's fun <laughs> always seeing uh, siblings and and how, uh, obviously, like you can tell like in facial features who who is or isn't a sibling in some ways, but it's more like they they have similar movements, the way that they attack the glass is similar, like there's some similarity in handle. Like it's always funny seeing things like that. Like even like Mark Williams and his sister Elizabeth who plays in the W, yeah. like seeing that kind of stuff is always funny. So yeah, but I'm excited to see what Maryland does next round. They Obviously, we're kind of up and down this season. I think that there's a real chance for them to give Alabama a good a good look. Genuinely had no idea that Angel Reese was Julian Reese's sister until now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I idea. know. That's very cool. And now, as soon as you said it, I was like, yeah, it is true. You can see it a little bit. You actually yeah. can see it a little bit. Okay. Uh, San Diego State, College of Charleston. College of Charleston kept this like relatively close the whole game, but – it did just feel like San Diego State's defensive ability really allowed them to muck it up in a pretty substantial way. Uh, they never really allowed College of Charleston to, you know, get out and play in transition in the way they want to, get out and space the floor in the way they want to. You know, San Diego State with Lamont Butler, with Nathan Mensa, these guys are really, really good defensively, and they just got timely shooting from Matt Bradley. Yeah, their depth and versatility was really fun to watch. Like, they're, they're physical. Um, they really were up in Charleston. Like, I think from a strategic standpoint, this was my favorite game that I've watched this weekend. Um, mm. Obviously, the whistle kind of killed it the last couple minutes as, as it became a little bit of a free throw fest. Um, but exactly like you mentioned, with what Matt Bradley did as a driver yesterday, that was so fun to watch. Uh, sneakily, very fun team that could make the Sweet 16. I would like to see that happen. I mean, that will, no, that's not, I mean, that could make the Elite Eight. It would be very hilarious if that happened. Um, I'm, yeah. they're a fun test for Alabama. Like a team, similarly, like we've seen Alabama have issues yep. with like Missouri, with Texas A&M. What does that look like when you get another physical team that can really put length on you, switch, do a lot of stuff to mark things up? Creighton 72, NC State 63. This was just the Turquavion Smith versus Ryan Kalkbrenner show. Ryan oh. Kalkbrenner. I think was one of the five or so most impressive players I watched this weekend. The rim protection was absolutely phenomenal. He made a three. He made a ton of really timely shots right around the basket. We said that, you know, post plays for Ryan Kolkbrenner aren't exactly the top of Creighton scouting report. Uh, but in this game, he was absolutely terrific at, you know, utilizing the ball whenever it came to him in those spots. Yeah. Um, agreed. The rolling was really impactful as well. He's such a good screener. Um, and, uh, is really impactful in his roles. Like he's a little bit more of a slow roller, um, but he yep. he hits with gravity. Like he doesn't. Even, he had a, a finish where like he didn't even have to jump and he put the ball through the hoop. Just a pretty effortless finisher. He's somebody I continue to think a lot about and being excited about as a as a like later in the draft type guy who could maybe really pop. And that three man, like the form looks good. I believe in the touch. I don't know. I'm, I think he can shoot. I, I think he's going to be a shooter in time, man. He's he's fun. But I got to say, Turk, dude, this was yeah. one hell of a game from Turk Smith. Um, I thought he had some really nice plays defensively, but the the um, the the offense was just like, man, he went right at Ryan Kalkbrenner off rip. And that's not to say that, like, it was like he was just, like, dominating Calc. Like, he had the, the dunk, obviously, like, left-handed monster tomahawk. Um, that was sick, but like watching that battle between them was really fun. Obviously, I think Cal Brenner really started to to hone in, ward him off a little bit as the game went on. And that's where you saw Turk start to get more into his pull-up game. But he was so good with that too. Like 
yep. this was a really impressive showing for him for somebody who really kind of struggled once he had that injury late in the year. Um, and just an ACC play in general, he was a little bit inconsistent, but to, I mean, this was a huge game from him. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Uh, I thought he was, he has that dunk at the end, but more than anything, I mean, he was just getting shots up. It felt like it will. And that was what they needed in this game, by the way. I don't mean that as a negative. Yeah. He just was able to get to a shot. Uh, and this was against really high level defense. Like Trey Alexander had to fight him all day. Yeah. And it was a really, really difficult matchup. And I thought Sir Quavion acquitted himself very, very, very well. Uh, Baylor 74, UC Santa Barbara 56. This is one we don't really need to say much about. I thought Adam Flagler looked very good. I thought yeah. Keontae George really struggled. But more than anything, it just felt like UC Santa Barbara never got going uh, in terms of like getting uh, a rhythm shooting the basketball in this game. Yeah, I will say I think good to see Baylor's defense click a little bit early in the tournament. That's something you want to yeah. see. Not that I think – I mean, UC Santa Barbara is actually pretty good. I really enjoy watching A.J. Mitchell play. Uh, this is like my first time really yep. getting eyes on him. He had some really nice passes, good finishes around the rim. Um, but I'm right there with you. I think Baylor was just too strong for them. Yeah, A.J. Mitchell is one of my favorite like mid-major guys in the country. It's the footwork, the handle, all of it's really terrific. I thought he should have had eight or nine assists in this game. Uh, yeah, and they just missed some open threes. It was tough. Just, just missed open threes. That's going to happen, though. Really needs to work on his shot, I think, to become anything resembling an NBA prospect. But, uh, you know, at six foot five as a lead ball handler, you do have quite a bit of wiggle room. Uh, to be able to make that leap at some point. Missouri 76, Utah State 65. Not quite the up and down, you know, all offense, all the time fest that I think many people expected from this game. Only 69 possessions. Uh, you know, Utah State went four of 24 from three. And that, that really just is going to kill a team like that who is so reliant on the three-point shot and has a number of elite-level shooters like Stephen Ashworth, Taylor Funk, Max Shulga. Yeah, uh, the big big story for me was Kobe Brown was awesome in this game. He was so oh, good, man. man. I've loved watching him play all year from Missouri, but this was a really good performance from him. I love – like, this, again, like – it's not the same as Penn State, but the same kind of idea of like just a team that can be kind of a buzzsaw for you with how they play. I'm excited to see what they do in the next round because this is, I mean, I, I'm biased to Dennis Gates was on Slapping Glass not that long ago. Love that pod. Dennis Gates is great. Um, so shout out to what they're doing. I'm excited for the next round. They play Princeton next round, and I would expect they're going to be highly favored in that matchup. They're much more versatile and multiple than Arizona is in a way that I would expect makes it much harder for Princeton. And I would expect they're going to be in the sweet 16. All due respect to Princeton as good as I think that staff is and as good as, you know, they prepared for Arizona. I think that Missouri is in a really, really good position to make a deep run in this tournament. And I don't know about you, but I, I have Kobe Brown as like a very clear, like top 50 prospect right now. Yeah. Class. I would agree with that for sure. Tons of size. Uh, I need the, he's somebody I want to go back and watch shots from the last couple of years, because I just frankly didn't watch Missouri last year if we're being yeah. blunt. Um, I want to compare, you know, his shot there to, to where it is now and, and get a better feel on what his trajectory is. But if, if his shots, you know, like even anything close to this, then yeah, I'm very in on him as a guy. That's what, I mean, that's an easy top 50 guy. Right. Uh, East region now. We've gone through FDU over Purdue. Florida Atlantic beats Memphis. That was uh, an incredibly fun game after the FDU upset over Purdue. Somehow we got a buzzer beater basically in that game uh, by, I believe, Nick Boyd, if I remember correctly. And uh, I mean, it's just going to be the thing that like nobody remembers from that site because of FDU, unfortunately. But an incredible comeback at Memphis, it felt like just completely fell apart at the seams late in that game. Yeah, uh, I will be completely honest. I did not. This is the one game I did not watch. Um, oh, I was you watching, missed a good one, man. I was watching the Princeton women's basketball team. Um, they went uh, there was the, that was a really nice uh, buzzer. Reader. I'm going to try and watch this game tomorrow morning, though. Yeah, really, really fun game. Really, really enjoyable, like up and down, helter-skelter, like a beautiful mess of a college basketball game in mm -hmm. like the best possible way. 
Uh, really fun. And now we get one of Florida Atlantic or fairly Dickinson in the sweet 16. And that just absolutely rules that one of those two teams in frankly, like two of the more difficult jobs in college basketball that they're going to be sitting there now in the sweet 16. One of those teams is pretty amazing to me. Duke beats Oral Roberts. We've talked about that quite a bit. Tennessee. We have talked about a little bit over Louisiana, uh, I did not catch a ton of this game, I will say, but what I caught, I was not wildly impressed with Tennessee in the ways that I was hoping to be impressed because this is a team that needs offense and I just don't know where it's going to come from. Yeah, exactly like kind of I alluded to with the game against Duke. I'm, I think it's going to be ugly, man. Like they basically need a, a, a Viscovi takeover, Tyreek Key to go crazy. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I don't know where the offense is coming from. Like, as much as uh, I know, like Sakai is not fair. I love watching Sakai play. I know that he's like not a perfect yeah. basketball player, but they just don't have ways to create offense in repeatable, easy ways without him. Um, and I, I mean, I, I know the defense is going to be there. I know the physicality is going to be there. So they're going to have a chance against Duke for sure. But it is, uh, it's going to be tough sledding, man. Yeah, no, I, shout out to Jordan Brown had 16 and seven in this game ends a very long college career that started at Nevada, ended up at Arizona and uh, played two years at Louisiana. I believe he's done. He might have one more year left, but I also think he's like 23 or 24 years yeah. old. He's, so it might he be time for him. He could have the COVID year. I'm looking right now because he, he, he had the medical. Well, no, not medical. It was a just a redshirt transfer. Uh, oh wait yeah he's old enough that he still had the real transfer rules uh at arizona um so i think yeah i still technically have the waiver then okay uh well maybe he'll come back but shout out jordan brown the sunbelt player of the year this year uh kentucky beats providence 61 to 53 I i liked kentucky way more than anybody else seemed to uh in this matchup and it's really just because providence doesn't run a lot of ball screen stuff that's just not yep. their game they're gonna run the flex they're gonna run uh, you know, things that will put Oscar in concerning situations off the ball, but not in on ball situations, which is where he really tends to struggle. You know, Kentucky looked fine in this game. Kentucky handled business exactly in the way I expected them to. Yeah. It's uh it sucks to see Bryce Hopkins is really fun year end like this. Uh, I'm not uber surprised. I thought that they'd have a shot against Kentucky, but same as you, like I didn't Kentucky has a lot of size. And I think teams with a lot of size that can stay in front against a team that runs flex is like, all right, well, you're, I'm interested to see how this goes. Um, yeah. And Bryce just never really got going today. They did a really good job defending him. I thought Kaysen had a really great game defensively, had a good floor game too. Just again, like they're uh, uh, Devin Carter, somebody who I've really enjoyed defensively this year, did give Kaysen some problems on offense. And I mean, that's, Again, part of like Kaysen playing out of position a little bit, having to really man the yeah. one. But it was a it was a, a bit of a rock fighty game. It was a rock fight for sure. Okay. Uh Kansas State, Montana State. Again, another game I did not see a ton of, if I'm being completely honest, because there were those two crazy games happening during it that involved TCU Arizona State. And uh, that was the Florida Atlantic Memphis window as well. So I, I probably paid less attention to this one than most other games. Did you catch this at all? Uh, not a ton. It wasn't really on my radar. I was not yeah. super worried about Kansas State winning this one. Um, so, yeah, no, not really a ton. Every time that I saw it, it felt like Marquise Noel was just kind of slicing up Montana State in a real way that – didn't seem to make this competitive. Just looking at the box score now for the first time, uh, 17 points, 14 assists. So yeah, that, that tracks that he was slicing them up pretty good. Uh, okay. Michigan state 72 USC 62. Tell me about your beloved Spartans. Mark Schindler. Uh, yeah, this game was not as close as the final uh, indicates. Yeah. Uh, Michigan state just ran away with this uh, late in the game. Um, it was honestly a really like the first half was really fun. It was a lot of uh, Drew Peterson starting to cook, but Michigan State, like credit to their game plan. They were like, OK, you know what? We know what you're trying to do to get things going in the half court. They stayed man on man against Drew pretty much the entire game. 
really took away any ability for USC to create a lot with passing windows. Like everything in the first half for them came off of cuts um, or out in transition or off of tough buckets. And uh, that was really difficult for them to live on in the second half. Like Tyson Walker had a really good game today. Um, Their defense really is – like it's been pretty good all year. That's been a lot of their staple. It's just been the, the issues that they have in the half court. And then I would add too, like Jaden Akins, he, I always want him to find the consistency, but the uh, the the flashes that he has, just in terms of his shot creation and as an athlete too, are extremely fun. And I felt like he had um, a lot of really poppy moments today that were big for MSU and in, in, in pulling this one out. Um, I, I don't really have a lot of faith in this team against Marquette, if we're <laughs> being honest. Like, Marquette is really good if you don't have somebody yeah. who can make skip passes routinely and beat the shit out of them by getting in the middle of the floor. So I'll be interested to see what that looks like, but um, this is a good one for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I just want to say, I think Tyson Walker did a phenomenal job defensively in this game. Yeah. Uh, above all. I thought he was absolutely terrific. But beyond that, uh, Marquette, who Michigan State will play, just presents real matchup problems for them. Like, you can't play Matty Sissoko in that game, really, because he's just going to get run off the court uh, on the perimeter in, in all of their crazy ball screen stuff. And Marquette, you know, they looked really good. I thought Vermont tried very hard to keep this tight, and there was just no shot. Yeah. It just wasn't really a chance for them to keep it all that tight. And if that's going to be the case... Yeah, this Marquette team's really good. They're defending at a high level now. They have real athletes on the wing. Omax Prosper, David Joplin, Stevie Mitchell is sort of a wing, more of a backcourt player. Uh, Tyler Kolek and also Godaro uh, as the you know one five ball screen combination. This is just this is my favorite team to watch in college basketball. I think I've said that probably five or six times on the show throughout the year, and I think they're terrific. And I you know given the way that this region has opened up. I think we're on a collision course for Duke and Marquette in the Elite Eight, and that would be a tremendous, tremendous matchup. Yeah, I want that. Because I think what's really fun about that, too, is like, and not to go too long on this, but like, I think Marquette's biggest struggle is dealing with uh, with guys who can post up because like they just don't have a real a real five. Like Oso is really more of a four um, who can handle a lot of the five stuff. But I wouldn't just like – I mean, yeah, obviously Flip can post up, but it's like, okay, well, what happens with Lively? So there's so much interesting stuff that you can look at, even just from seeing what Duke's prospects look like and against a really fun defense. So yeah, I'm with you. I'm 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 excited about that potential matchup. Okay, going over to the other side of the bracket now, Houston against Northern Kentucky. You mentioned that Northern Kentucky gave like a real effort here. I thought they were tremendous in this game. The issue is just for Houston. Marcus Sasser uh, tried to play this game, ended up sitting down after a little while. Jamal Shedd apparently has, I believe, a knee injury that Calvin Sampson talked about uh, in the post game as well. They're playing essentially a road game now against Auburn uh, in Birmingham. I'm pretty worried about Houston moving forward in this tournament. Uh, I, yeah, I think I'm worried ish. Like I, I think for me, I would like to, obviously like I need Marcus to be healthy for them to feel good about them as a past the second weekend team. But to be honest with like this Auburn team just isn't that good. Like yeah. to that, that's probably, that sounds rude. Like I think that they have some pieces that are, Oh no, they that- Janai Broom, Janai Broom had a hell of a game <laughs> against Iowa, but like I do not trust Auburn's guards at all against what Houston can bring defensively. Like yeah. I think the ball pressure is just going to be too much for them, um, and I don't think that that front court is good enough to handle what Houston's going to be able to do to them as well. And like as much as uh, the team struggled in general, like Jamal Shedd is so good. Um, I even if like even if Sasser is only like a twenty minute a game. 20 minutes a game in this, like I still, I still be pretty comfortable about them. Look, I, I'm going to pick them to win. I've picked them to win the whole way, but I mean, goodness, the, the, I, I'm terrified about Marcus Sasser not being healthy. And if Jamal Shedd is like very, you know, is hurt more hurt than what people think at the very least. 
Yeah. Katie Johnson and Wendell Green can get hot at the very least. Like it, it, there are games where those two were just unconscious on some level or one of them is unconscious. And if that happens in Chad and Sasser, like aren't a hundred percent, that game becomes dicey in a hurry, I think. Yeah. But you know, it's going to be a rock fight. It's going to be a mess and we'll see where it goes. Okay. Uh, Auburn beat Iowa. Uh, this game I thought was like kind of a mess if I'm being completely honest. And, uh, you know, Chris Murray, it looks like his career you know, will likely come to an end is maybe the way to put it. He obviously hasn't made a draft decision yet, but, you know, projected as a first round pick. I thought Chris Murray really struggled with Auburn's length and athleticism in this game. Yeah, I think it was interesting. I uh, I noted this on uh, – yeah, I was talking to our friend Zach Miller yesterday when we were watching the game together. Um, and I think what the biggest separator between Chris and Keegan for me is like – obviously Chris has a little bit more of the drive game and how he can get into the paint and get to the rim. But Keegan embraced contact so much better last year. Oh, I think that's going to be the biggest biggest thing that Chris is going to need to develop at the next level. And to be fair, like I think that's something you can develop. But you really saw that play against Auburn's physicality yesterday. Well, it's the shooting mechanics as well. Like yeah. Keegan gets the shot off way quicker. I think he just plays more on balance, to be honest, uh, than Chris does. And it just is easier for Keegan to have that. Like it goes with the strength as well. Exactly what you're saying. Like him always being on balance makes him really difficult to bump. Yeah. And he plays through contact just way better than Chris does. That's why, like, look, people have asked like, oh my God, like how can you have Keegan Murray as a you know, seventh or eighth best prospect last year and you have... Chris Murray at 20, there are real tangible differences between the two yeah. and Keegan is a better prospect, but Chris is a real first round pick. And I would guess he goes somewhere around 20th overall. Okay. Next up here, Miami versus Drake, man, Drake just ran out of steam at the end of this. <laughs> that was a huge bummer. It looked like we were on there on the way to another upset and Drake just completely ran out of steam. Yeah, it was really tough. Um, as good as, Tucker DeVries has been this entire year. He just did not have it from outside tonight. I think, what, he finished 1-9, 1-10. Um, one for 13 from the field overall, one for yeah. 11 from three. Yeah, a really tough showing for him. It should not demark him as a prospect, but uh, it definitely yeah. was a, a tough way to go out for sure. Yeah, Nigel Pack uh, was the big one here yeah. for Miami. I thought he played really, really well. Uh, they went through difficulties with Isaiah Wong. In this game, he went one for 10. And Nigel Pack was the offense that they needed. And by the way, shout out to Wuga Poplar. Like he's been hooping, really, man. really, yeah, really, really interesting long term prospect. I think six foot five defends well. You know, the shooting is, you know, hit or miss. It feels like sometimes he's a bit streaky, but I do think that he is probably their best long term prospect, if I'm being honest. Interesting. Yeah, no, I think I'd have to think on it more, but yeah, I probably agree. It was good to see Norchad Omir like out and healthy yeah. again, just after the pretty scary uh, ankle injury. So that was good. Shout out Jordan Miller. Always. I love watching that dude play, man. He is so freaking good. Just uh, an incredible basketball player. Like he does everything right on the basketball court. Um, yeah, I, I could, I could gush about this Miami team for forever, man. They're good. So Indiana beats, Kent State 71 to 60. I'll be honest. I watched the first half of this game and I was just bummed because sincere carry, it seems like bumped knees with somebody in like the pregame warmups and just didn't look to have that same kind of like juice. You know, you made that like crazy, like, I don't even know, like circus shot. Almost. It was incredible, man. I clipped it and put it on Twitter. It was uh, unreal. Like that was, that was so sick, dude. But that, that was like really all he did. Like he went, I think five for 18 from the field, really struggled. Yeah. He couldn't really uh, get into the paint too much. Yeah. I mean, look, like they played not terribly defensively, but you know, they, they did what they were going to do just in terms of, uh, you know, making life harder for Jalen Hood Shafino, I felt like, but Trace Jackson Davis just continues to be. I think he's the best player remaining in the tournament at the very least. And look, yeah, Trace Jackson Davis is the exception to what we were talking about earlier. Well, because like, predicts. man, this was, I, I'll just say point blank. This is the best game anybody's played in the tournament yet. Like, yeah, he was unreal tonight. Uh, the passing was sick. 
the ball control and ball handling was awesome. Like he was able to face up, could he brought the ball up a couple times? Like he did so much with that. But the rim protection was just something else tonight. Like he was everywhere. I think that was the biggest differentiator for me in the game. Like Kent State, honestly, I like you mentioned, I thought defensively they, they did they did a pretty good job, but it just ended up becoming they could not do anything to get the ball inside because Trace was coming from every which direction to blow shit up at the rim. Ike ended up finishing yeah. with six or seven blocks tonight. Um I what he dunked like five times in the second half. It was that was a special performance, man. He was so good. I love like it's funny because like yeah. I there are a lot of people in our sphere who do not like watching Trace play. I love watching TJD play basketball. That's oh, like, he's so good. He's so smart. Like he's become he's developed like people are like, oh yeah, like he's still just like this, you know, post player. And he's just nowhere near that. Like yeah. the short roll game, the passing ability, the ability to put the ball on the deck. Like, yeah, he can't shoot. You know what? There are so many more important things that he, he can does do. everything but shoot. It's incredible. Yeah. Like, it is super, super impressive, man. Super the way that guy. I was talking about this with somebody the other day, but the way that his feel for the game has come along compared to where it was two years ago is like pretty wild to contemplate. Like, not that I ever thought he was like some terrible field prospect, but like for him to become this level of passer and somebody who has like the kind of composure he has on the court, um, it's not what I would have expected in 2020. So it's been really yeah. cool to watch the development for him. Really, really cool. Uh, okay, next up, we have got uh, Iowa State Pitt. I think the less said about this game, the better. Like, yeah. just being complete. This game was good ugly for Pitt. as hell. Good, good for my hometown. This was the worst game I saw all tournament. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. Actually, it's the second worst game. The worst game I saw was Iowa, or it was uh, Mississippi State Pitt. Uh, oh, the, I like that game, man. That game was fun. Uh, I enjoyed that game. No disrespect. Yeah, no, that was a. Uh, it wasn't really that one. Wasn't really Pitt's fault. That it was bad. That was Mississippi State's fault. That that was bad. But uh, Pitt in this one just did a phenomenal job defensively against Iowa State. Iowa State just does not have the juice offensively yep. uh, to be able to beat a team that is NCAA tournament quality right now. It feels like unless that team is Baylor. So. You know, uh, shout out to Pitt. Really great season. Really big turnaround for Jeff Capel and company. Uh, you know, it's now probably they get Xavier. coming to an end against Xavier. Yeah. Look, I mean, we got the Sean Miller Bowl. You never know. He might, you know, might just toss it away to the alma mater. Shout out Sean Miller. Love it. It's possible. I got to say, before we even get started with Kennesaw State, the Kennesaw State logo rocks, dude. I love so good. their branding. It's so good. Um, Chris Youngblood, it sucks seeing him foul out here because he was so good in this game. Like, Kennesaw, they were legitimately taking it to Xavier until the last, like, five, six minutes. Um, yeah. Like, that uh, – it was so tough to see because, like, again, like, not to div divulge in the cliches, but it's, like, it's so apparent watching the difference in college basketball and the NBA when you're watching, like, the last five minutes of a game. <laughs> Because I can't remember uh, Kennesaw State's starting point guard's name, but like I think he legitimately had fifty percent usage in the last five minutes. To because, Terrell Burden, yeah. Like it was tough too, because like he was he'd been having a good game, but I I think he just got in his head and like he just drove and he kept Chris Pauling it, like kept like I'm gonna drive in and keep driving around, and it he like ended up getting a couple of charge calls, uh, threw up some really difficult shots just got massive tunnel vision and uh, it really was rough for them. I think that what did they go outside the line? I don't think they scored a bucket other than one, like maybe one in the last five minutes. Not sure they did either. Yeah. yeah. It felt like, you know, I know they only scored, I think like eight in the last 10 minutes. And by the way, the guy that turned that for Xavier was Colby Jones. Yeah. Colby Jones was the X factor for them in this game. He his defensive ability. This is a team that desperately struggled to get stops. I think that I think it was like I think Kennesaw State had like 61 points uh, with nine and nine fifty left in this game. And then they went scoreless for six minutes because Colby Jones like completely shut off everything that Kennesaw did. And then they got like six points real quick at the end. But oh, man, 
Colby Jones was phenomenal in this game. I know he didn't shoot it super well. He had like a couple like ugly air ball looking shots. Um, but he, he was the difference to me. Him Look, Jerome Hunter was the best player on the court in this game, which is like, you know, something that I think took everybody by surprise. But Colby Jones was the guy that turned it when Xavier needed it the most. And he's the guy that said, we are not losing this game point blank and turned it. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, he was exceptional tonight. And like you mentioned with Colby, too, it was interesting because he had uh, he had kind of a rough offensive game. I thought, like, some of the passing stuff was nice, but he struggled a little bit with his touch around the rim. To be fair, though, like, I think both teams missed more layups than they made in this game. Uh, it was really rough around the rim. But, um, yeah, he was fun to like, – exactly like you mentioned. The defense was huge in shutting down what kind of saw was running. We've already talked about Texas a and Penn State. Texas beats Colgate by 20. This was just a situation where Colgate was like completely outgunned athletically. It felt like. Serge Barry Rice was awesome. Like Terrific. this game was like somewhat close. And then Serge Barry Rice scored like 10 points in two or three minutes. And it's kind of all she wrote from there. Yeah. Uh, this was always going to be a tough one for Colgate. It felt like to me, there was just, I felt like no way that they really had the wherewithal to defend Texas. As long as Texas made a reasonable amount of shots, it felt like they were going to win pretty easily. And unfortunately for Colgate, that is what happened. And now we await the future of Matt Langle. There are multiple openings, including Temple, uh, particularly where he is a former assistant that make a lot of sense for him moving mm -hmm. forward. Okay. Uh, Kansas Howard going to the West region. Now, Kansas, uh, that was just a very clinical, easy game for them. You know, I, I felt like, uh, once it got into the second half and they were able to, uh, you know, really just kind of felt like slow down a little bit. You know, Howard did a really, really good job early in that game, keeping it close, but it felt like once Kansas slowed down, especially in like you know, the last four minutes of the first half that it was going to be fine. Yeah, no, I, I concur for sure. I do just want to give a shout out to Howard. Uh, Kenny Blakeney's doing an awesome job there from where they started yep. at a couple of years ago. Um, and to be where they're at now, like it feels wild saying Steve Settle has been playing college basketball for, for four years already. Um, so yeah, I just shout out to, to what they're doing. Like, like you mentioned their, their ability to play with length and, and with versatility to play deep. Um, they're a team I've enjoyed watching. Uh, it was just like, they're not your typical 16 seed. Like they're really good, but having to play Kansas is just like, that's Kansas, Kansas, man. It's tough. Illinois drops a game to Arkansas 73 to 63. This was just an ugly, ugly, ugly game. Ricky council, the fourth had 18 and 10 and, you know, Devo Davis had 16 this one just, man, there was, it was a lot of ugly. It felt like this was like yeah. an up and down game that, you know, Arkansas won scoring, you know, 0.94 points per possession. Like it was, it was a hideous basketball game. Yeah. Outside of transition and a flurry from RJ Melendez uh, in like the middle of the second half, Illinois had nothing to do offensively in this game against what Arkansas was bringing defensively. Yeah. No, I think that's right. Uh, we do now get Arkansas and kansas which gives us grady dick against and jalen wilson and kevin mcculler against anthony black nick smith etc rookie council that's one of the best prospect games we'll probably get the entire ncaa tournament so yeah. you, i honestly i think kansas needs bill self to win that game uh i, I hope that bill is able to get back on the sidelines you know get healthy get uh, everything checked out with his heart condition or heart situation, uh, whatever it is. I don't want to act like he has a condition, but um, wh whatever's going on with Bill Self, I really wish him the best. And I hope that he's able to get back on the sidelines because he is, for my money, the best in game coach in college basketball. Uh, and, you know, to win and to reach their fullest potential, Kansas does need him. But, you know, first and foremost, you know, shout out to Bill Self's health. Bill Self's health. It is very late here. Uh, <sighs> on my body clock at the very least. Okay. Next up St. Mary's 63 VCU 51. You know, I picked VCU in this game and if I did, I guess I like didn't recognize how hurt Ace Baldwin was. Yeah. Uh, I knew he was not healthy coming into the game, but he just like was not even 
you know, it, it just, he played like reasonably well, like he had 13 points and three assists, but like he, he just, it felt like didn't have the same energy and like, you know, athleticism that he typically plays with in terms of like annoying at the point of attack, uh, you know, harassing ball handlers and everything. Yeah, definitely. And uh, it's worth noting too, like I felt like St. Mary's just really took them to task in the paint uh, later on in the game. Like they're so good with doing their, it not it's not the same as Tennessee, but their ability to kind of just like jump stop on drives, hit cutters, go back door, like, they were kind of always constantly moving, and I felt like it really killed VCU's defense down the stretch. Yep. UConn 87, Iona 63. Look, I have a bracket in a not uh, not cheap pool that I'm in that I have Connecticut as the winner, and the second half for Connecticut was probably the second most impressed I've been by any team uh, during the tournament so far, uh, the first one being Duke that we've talked about already. I mean, my goodness, when UConn put on the Jets, it was just over. Yeah, uh, Adama Sanogo hit his, like, Super Saiyan mode, just went crazy in the second half, was hitting everything. Uh, it felt like they were really finally able to use their size um, and really take advantage of it. It was cool to see in some – well, not not cool. Like, you always want to see a guy have a good game. But, like, a game where Iona really uh, was able to deny Jordan Hawkins a lot in the first half, keep the ball out of yep. his hands, keep him from having an impact – and then UConn's like, okay, well, we have – exactly. Like, I mean, this is what we're talking about with what happened with Purdue. Like, okay, if you sh- if you find ways to try and make it much harder to get your main option going, what happens from there? And I think you saw what happens when you have a roster that is a lot more versatile tonight and what UConn was able to do. Donovan Klingon and Adama Sanogo combined for 40 points and 22 rebounds in this game. Uh, this was just a bludgeoning on the interior, it felt like. Uh, Jordan Hawkins also really got going. He had 13 second half points and was just, he was the reason. When Jordan Hawkins goes, Connecticut wins. That's really what it comes down to. When he is able to knock down shots and get free, they win. And as long as that happens against St. Mary's, I would expect them to win, but we shall see. Okay. Final little pocket here. TCU beats Arizona state on a late Jacoby Coles floater. Mike miles show. That's what this was. It was the Mike miles show. He was absolutely tremendous. Uh, 26 points, despite the fact that he's playing very clearly injured in this game. And just an absolutely terrific, terrific performance. Uh, We had someone on Twitter ask, uh, what is Mike Miles' NBA projection? Uh, How how would you feel about that? Uh, Dude, I – it's tough. It's – because I did like a really big deep dive on on the Big 12 um, a couple weeks ago. Like I like Mike. I think the drive game really pops and it's special. Um. For well, special is probably too much. Special for for where he is as a college guard, like it there, it is legitimately so hard for teams to stop him if he gets his head down. I just don't think that the passing or the shot is good enough to a level where I feel great about him as a big time NBA prospect with what he like. And again, I'm not trying like I almost feel like I'd rather see him go back for one more year and try and get his shot right or really try and lean into it. Um, because he is like what he does is really good. Like the pop around the rim is so impressive. Um, but I, it's like exactly what we're talking about with stuff with like Sharif Cooper. Like, okay, they're very different prospects, but the same idea of, okay, you just, your margins are so much slimmer when you were a smaller yeah. guard. And if you're not going to be somebody who's bringing a ton of shooting gravity, like, like a Trey Young esque player who's that size, it's just so hard to really stick and find it te- less about the sticking more finding a team that's willing to give you the opportunities. Um, yeah. So I I don't mean to be all doom and gloom. I like Mike Miles. He's a hell of a player, but um, I think it would be really tough for me with seeing him as a high draft pick right now. I agree. I think he'd be tremendous over here, <laughs> like in Australia. Yeah. You put him in the NBL, I think he'd be a monster here. I would yeah. love, like Bryce Cotton type player uh, here. Like would be so so good. He needs to work on the shot. Bryce worked on the shot. Like got it to where it's like really really high level. I think Mike will get there at some point. Um, but yeah, if he wants to go pro, that's that's a spot that's interesting to me. Just over here, uh, on, on this side of the Pacific Ocean. 
Okay. Uh, next up, we have got the Gonzaga Grand Canyon game. Gonzaga won that by like 15, right? 12. Uh, again, a game that like I didn't feel like I caught a ton of it. Uh, did you catch a lot of this game? No, not really. Yeah, it felt like when I was watching it that like it was a lot of Julian Strother and like Drew Timmy, like two man game. And it felt like Grand Canyon did not have many answers. Yeah. Yeah, that's really all I've got. We're going to get a great matchup with TCU and Gonzaga because TCU uh, is a really, really good defensive team. Really, really good defensive unit. Uh, Their issue is going to be if they have anybody to guard Timmy on the interior. We shall see on that front. Yeah. Shout out to Big Eddie Lampkin, who entered the transfer portal. Very excited for where he lands next. He's one of my favorite players to watch in basketball, man. The vibes are immaculate when Big Eddie Lampkin's out there. Not, not totally sure about the Eddie Lampkin vibes for me, but I uh, I respect your takes. Uh, Northwestern beats Boise State in just a very dull basketball game, if I'm being completely honest. Boo Booey was great. Uh, that That's really all I've got, though, for this one. Yeah, him and Chase Adige, really fun to watch. Boise State, it was uh, it. I felt they were very clearly overmatched uh, from pretty much tip on this game. Yeah. Uh, so that was it was a tough one for them. Yeah, that this was not a particularly fun game. Uh, Chase Odige also goes for twenty. It didn't really feel like he was going for twenty while he was doing it, which is interesting. But Boo Boo, he was like the star. He was the star of the show. He ended up mm-hmm. with twenty-two points, five assists versus only one turnover. Uh, ter- terrific, terrific game for him. And this is a terrific backcourt between Bowie and Odige uh, that will go up against UCLA without Jalen Clark. And this is a very fun matchup. Now UCLA just absolutely, you know wiped uh, Asheville off the map. It felt like they won by 33. Uh, this was a matchup as well that a Dem Bona did not play in. I actually kind of sneaky had some interest in Asheville. If Bona wasn't going to play. I, I mean, the way UCLA that UCLA. Said no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Th- th- this was ridiculous. I, I mean, Jaime Jaquez just absolutely demolished anybody in front of him in this game also really good Amari Bailey game Amari Bailey is like kind of sneaky really coming on over the second half of the Pac-12 season uh yeah really really impressive from UCLA incredibly impressive from them given that this was a team without Jalen Clark and a Dembona yeah I think what you mentioned is what I'm most excited to see continue to play out as the the turning goes on how does Amari Bailey continue to pop and fill that void because I thought defensively he really was fantastic in this game um yep the offense, obviously, we saw come along even more in the Pac-12 tournament. I want to see more and more and more. I really like him. Um, the way that he's grown this year has been so fun to watch. Yeah. I mean, by the way, the Bruins got, uh, I believe, like 20 and 6 from Mac, ETN, and Kenny Wuba. Uh, Cannot bet I mean, on that happening again. Yeah. Look, straight up, if they get 20 points every game from Mac, ETN, and Kenny Wuba, they That's a 40 no basketball team. Or winning the title, just straight yeah. up. Uh, but I don't, I don't see that happening again. I, I do think that Northwestern defensively can pose them some issues. This will probably be a pretty ugly game. I would imagine they probably use Odige to guard Hawkes in the way that Hawkes likes to post. I feel like that's going to be a pretty tough matchup for him. Uh, maybe use Chase on. Yeah, maybe you use like Bowie on Singleton and Odige on Tiger Campbell, and then like you try and guard Hawkes with a bigger guy. That's a mass mismatch problem. I feel like this is why UCLA is so good. They have so many good perimeter players, as much as anything. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. Okay, we, we've gone through the bracket. That's all I have, Mark. That's everything that we're gonna do here. That makes, uh, yeah, that makes two of us. I'm I'm good to bounce whatever. <laughs> Any other firm takeaways here uh, before we leave? Uh, Saco came bear this week. Uh, somewhat recommend that to people. It's like a C plus B minus. You know what you're getting into. Okay. Yeah. I'm here for it. Have not watched many movies. Um, Laura and I caught up on Abbott Elementary last night. Oh, I did That's, that today. It was good. Yeah. Really fun. That's about all I've got, though. This is the end of the show. Uh, We will be back on Sunday night with Adam Spinella breaking down everything that we saw over the weekend uh, in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Until next time, though, 
please rate, review, subscribe. Go to iTunes, Spotify, whatever podcasting platform, Apple, whatever you're using. Uh, please subscribe there. Go to the YouTube channel. Subscribe. Game Theory Podcast with Sam Vecini. Uh, you know, go to The Athletic, theathletic.com slash game theory. Hit that subscribe button. That's one of the best ways that you can support the show. That is officially all we've got. Until next time, we will talk soon. Bye.